I'm Realtor Deb Tomorrow, and this is At Home in Bloomington, brought to you by Karen Russell, Ruoff Home Mortgage. We profile the people, places, and resources that make Bloomington Bloomington and help you live your best life at home in Bloomington. Hello and welcome to At Home in Bloomington. I am your host, Realtor Deb Tomorrow, and I am joined as usual by the lovely Miss Karen Rastel, best damn letter in the state of Indiana. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you today? I'm fantastic. What about you? Um, I'm a little hyper. Yeah. As, as I disclosed off air, I changed up my vitamin regimen this morning, and maybe not the best day to do that. Okay. Because there was, I, I, I took something. I'm not sure what it was. I mean, it was a vitamin of some sort. Did you get it off the streets? No, or? I mean, I have like <laughs> bottles, but I kind of, it's a long story and yeah. nothing I say today is going to make any sense. So, okay. Um, grab a glass of wine and listen into the show because you're in for a ride, I think. All right, here we Which go. Which I don't know is that different than usual. So, so you don't know who our guest is today. No, I do not. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm going to like wax poetic, as I said before the show, and you were kind of like, I don't know where you're going with this and slightly afraid, but... Um, I'm going to take a little walk down memory lane. But do you ever look back and think, like, how did I get here? Like, just in general. Oh, like my emotional journey? Yeah, not like I, I turned <laughs> my, on the my runway. mental journey? I turned down Sarah Road. Not like that, but like... Yes. And, and, and sort of like, I here's something I do, I think maybe when I can't sleep at night or something. What was the traje- trajectory of events that kind of led me to either where I am or like, I do this a lot with clients. It's kind of fun. Like you think back, like, well, how did I meet that person? And you met them, maybe referred from someone else, but where did that person come from? Where did that person come from? Right. And you kind of trace back and figure out where it all started, right? Sure. And and I think that for businesses, that's an interesting thing to do because it certainly helps you. You can learn a lot from that. Mm-hmm. I think in general in life, you know, looking at history in that mm-hmm. sense can also be really useful. But today's guest is actually um, with a place that they don't know played a really pivotal role in my real estate career. Mm. I know, right? Oh, she looks shocked. I know. She looks shocked. She's like, she's what? So what? She face. thought I was going to go one direction with this, and <laughs> nope, I'm going a different direction. Um, so way back when I returned to Bloomington, um, about 13, it was 2006, so what's that, about 13 years ago, um, I had great opportunity sort of in front of me. And I was really appreciative of that. I was appreciative of Bloomington being really receptive to me and my real estate business and just all the opportunities. And so I decided that I wanted to get involved in the community. I didn't know anybody. um, And I wanted to, I made a pledge to myself that I was going to get involved in a couple of nonprofits. And so trying to figure out what nonprofits I wanted to get involved in, I stumbled upon a presentation that Bloomington Restorations was doing Um, And it was offered at the Monroe County History Center. And so I went there and listened to their presentation. And I actually ended up serving um, on the board of Bloomington Restorations for about six years. Still helped them a lot pro bono with the real estate needs. If you don't know what Bloomington Restorations is, check them out on Facebook. They um, are looking to preserve a lot of the interesting architecture and homes um, that make Bloomington, give Bloomington that vibe. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I met so many people traced back through that connection with Bloomington Restorations, which started at the Monroe County History Center. Okay. So Andrew or so you're from the Monroe County History so Center. Andrea okay, Hatso, awesome. which who is from the Monroe County History Center. So there you go. I'm done. Show's over. I'm okay. just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. No, no quizzing for right? this episode. <laughs> so that's where it has always held a really special place for me, just because you hosted Bloomington Restorations and then, you know, it was it's amazing to think like just that one decision. I'm just going to go to this presentation. I don't know. I don't know anybody. I'm just going to sit in this room and watch some slides and listen to somebody talk. And it changes your life. Yeah. It opened up a huge right? door. Yeah. yeah. There's so many clients I have that I trace back through that lineage. I should have like a tree, like a family tree. But anyways. Okay. But it's about our guest today and not me. So Andrea, what's your role at the History Center? So at the History Center, I am the education manager. I do programming for ages 5 to 95 Mm -hmm. and all of them in between uh, from school field trips to programs like the Bloomington Restoration uh, folks coming through. We partner with a lot of local nonprofits uh, because we have such a great network of Mm -hmm. organizations here in town. It seems like when I look at um, Facebook or um, the website that there's events going on all mm-hmm. the time. Yeah. What are some like examples of events? 
So recently we actually just had a pop-up preview of our annual garage sale fundraiser, Mm -hmm. which is the largest in the county. We have a garage sale that people donate to all year round that... Uh, raises over $100,000 for us for operating costs. That's crazy. And it's absolutely amazing. If you're into thrifting, if you're into antiquing, or if you're looking to downsize, it's a great place to go. It's about 22,000 square feet of a warehouse. So it's, Over where the old RCA plant was. Yes, that's is. foreshadowing. Um, <laughs> hang with me there and you'll get that. Um, and that's typically, because we don't know when people are going to be listening to this podcast. They could be listening two years from now, but it's typically in June of each. Is that right? Yes. So it is generally, uh, it flips between the second and third weekends of June. Okay. Uh, so this year it's June 14th and 15th. Okay. So that's awesome. Um, and we'll talk more about fundraising and volunteer opportunities and things like that. But I want to talk, just kind of go back to the history of the um uh, history center, the history of the history center. Mm-hmm. One of the things that struck me was that the organization, I believe, has actually been around since like 1905 or something crazy like that. Yes. And that was, there wasn't that physical location, obviously, but do you know what the group was trying to do back there in 1905? A lot of historical societies back at that time were really just coming together to preserve old documents, uh, making sure that a lot of what they found to be historically um, important was kept safe for future generations, which is still kind of our mission today. Mm -hmm. Uh, And really they kind of waxed and waned throughout the years and and, well, the decades. Uh, So originally where we are located, it was not the building that is there now. Mm -hmm. It used to be the center school. Mm -hmm. uh, And we actually have two historical markers from Indiana landmarks that are in our front lawn one for the center school um, and what became the colored school Mm -hmm. where those children who were segregated in the African-American community were, uh, they went to school and whatnot. And then in 1918, uh, the building was torn down and a Carnegie library was built and it was the first public library for Monroe County. And so that's where we are now. Yeah. I love Carnegie libraries. I don't know. I love that you can go, I mean, I've seen them East Coast, West Coast, and everywhere in between, Mm -hmm. and you see it and you know that's a Carnegie Library, and it's just sort of a uh, this thread of commonality that runs through the country. Mm -hmm. I've Um, never seen the outside or the inside of one, so... Wait, do you know where I, the Monroe County History I, Center is? I have no idea where it is. So located. it's uh, uh, for, what's the address? For 200 something. It's 202 <laughs> there you East 6th Street. It's uh, right East 6th across Street. from the public library now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you so go down 6th Street, which is one way. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's just before you get to the library is that really gorgeous building right there on mm-hmm. the south side of the road. Um, on on your right side and it's been added on to yes so there's and i'm imagining that that part the addition on the back is where a lot of the storage and things like that archives are Mm -hmm. but the actual galleries are in the original library space okay Um, i'll pay attention i go down sixth street when i'm going to a board meeting once Mm -hmm. a month Mm -hmm. but i'm having to watch for parking (laughs) parking and people who kind of dart out so i don't even i know i know that area but um i've never even looked over the entrance is on washington yes yep so it's on the side on washington so you don't go up the steps to to the main entrance what you feel like is the main entrance because that's the galleries um so there's an entrance on the side there but um it's a really cool building um and it actually sat vacant, right? It was a library until about 1970, mm-hmm. and it sat vacant for, I think, about eight years? About eight years, and then a group that was dubbed the Old Library Incorporated, uh, shortened to Tolly, uh, actually got the building for a dollar, and they had a whole bunch of different nonprofit organizations that were housed within the building until about 1980, 1981, when the Historical Society took it over, started uh, revitalizing, revamping it, um, in part thanks very much uh, to the cooks who took an interest in revitalizing Bloomington. And then the addition, where a lot of our staff offices and collection storage uh, was built in the late 90s. Um, so it's very accessible. Um, admission is super inexpensive. It's two dollars to just go in and take a look around. And there's memberships, and I'm super excited about this, Karen. 
You know my museum membership obsession. Yes, it's I do. growing. Yes. So we had an episode. Uh, I don't know. It's been a while with Wonder Lab, and we talked about how if you had a certain kind of membership at Wonder Lab, you would get free admission to all these different museums all over the country, and it was the deal of the century because you could get into, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of museums. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? Is this History Center is on board too? Okay. So I was doing some research. I don't know if you know this. You probably do know this since you work there, but. I'm, I'm obsessive. So if there's certain levels of membership. Some are as low as $20, $35. Um, there's one level at $100, and it gets you membership into, I wrote it down so I didn't forget, the uh, North American Reciprocal Museums. Mm-hmm. And there's over a 1,000 museums. I may or may not have brought our membership. Oh, good. For oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Because I was like, I should have downloaded that. Um, over a 1,000 museums that you can get entrance into. And so you can go to the website and look at the list. And so I was looking at some places that we typically go to. Um, yours is from the Berkshires. And so we travel there. And I looked at just one museum um, in the Berkshires. It's called The Mount. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a historical home that was the home for Edith Wharton, Wharton, who's an author. $20 per person to get in. But if you had the membership here. Yeah, you know, just go yeah. in. Just walk on in. It's all good. We're all family. That is awesome. Yeah, a 1000 So what are other... Make sure that I have the level yeah. of membership correct. Uh, so that one hundred dollar membership level is the supporter membership, okay. um, but all of our membership levels actually include the time travelers reciprocal uh, museum membership program, which gets you about three hundred history museums across the nation. Oh, nice! And then NARM, the North yeah. American Reciprocal Museums, is actually an international program yeah. as well. So you can get into some places, Canada um, and, and Venezuela yes. or something. Yeah. Yes. So it's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and just going down the list, uh, the more you pay in your membership mm-hmm. pledge. Uh, you also have uh, some discounted rates for other museums in the state of Indiana, as well as the option for behind-the-scenes tours and collections and yeah. some uh, private events and maybe some uh, extra early previews of exhibits, which is a fantastic opportunity yeah. uh, for such a, a local museum. Yeah. We've actually had members who have given up their uh, membership for like the Indianapolis Museum of Art because mm-hmm. they were a part of NARM. Oh, okay. And so they said, you know what, I'm going to be, I'm going to give to my local yeah. history mm-hmm. museum right. and I'll still get that benefit of right. NARM to go to what is now Newfields. Right. Uh, so. Yeah. I, and now I think that's going to be, that's like my mission now. I want everyone to know, like, before you go on vacation, if you're going to go and hit any museums, you need to hit up your local museums and see if they have right. some reciprocal memberships mm-hmm. because um, we definitely want to, you know, keep things local if we can. It's really, really cool. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the exhibits that you currently have. Um, uh, we had, I had mentioned RCA. And so you've got a big exhibit right now, which is Women of RCA. Yes. And that's uh, really fun. It talks about um, the evolution of women in the workforce during World War II um, and, and has some interesting things. And I, uh, I immediately called Uris and I was like, I just learned a really interesting fun fact, which was the Madam X. Yes. Can you share that story of what, what's, what was going on here? Mm-hmm. So the Madam X project uh, took place in what was nicknamed the secret room in the RCA plants. So it was a obviously secret project that was attached to the U.S. military, and they were creating uh, missile heads, which you can actually see, uh, I believe it is one of the missile heads that they created that one of our members actually loaned us (laughs) on exhibit. Uh, And so that was actually quite integral to a lot of the success that we had within World War II. And we, decades later, still had a lot of FBI monitoring of telling the story about what happened in the secret room, what they were building. Uh, So there's not a lot of concrete information about it, um, but we do have several people in the community who still say, I worked in the secret room, or my mother did, or my... And I can't tell you about it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. They Um, said that, uh, I read that it was second only to the Manhattan Project in terms of the secrecy of it, and the Manhattan Project was the atomic bomb. mm -hmm. So it was a really big deal going on here uh, in Bloomington. There were FBI agents, you know, that is I'm so assuming cool. we were like, well, yeah. how did they monitor? They probably were just sat in their black, big black cars and, you know, in their fedoras and just sat and watched people leave work and followed them. And right. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's kind of crazy to think about. So how often. So that's a temporary exhibit that right. Mm-hmm. That's not permanent. So how long do those exhibits typically stay? 
So that gallery in particular, our rector gallery, changes about every four to five months. Okay. So the Women in RCA exhibit will actually be ending uh, in May 18th okay. of this year, 2019, mm-hmm. and then we will be opening up Michelangelo's of Monroe, which will be talking about famous limestone carvers from Monroe mm-hmm. County, and we'll be featuring some contemporary carvers as well oh, nice. beginning in June for Limestone Month. Cool. And then you have exhibits that are always there, right? Like the school room. There's sort of a pioneer school room and a log cabin. Yes. Um, and I imagine those are pretty popular with the school kids. Absolutely. And we're constantly doing small adjustments uh, to our permanent gallery just to make sure that we're updating and being inclusive with the stories that mm-hmm. we're telling for Monroe County's history. But all of the kids that I have on field trips say that they love the schoolhouse. Yeah. They don't want to go to school in right. one-room schoolhouse, right. but they think it's, it's the tiny. Coolest yeah, thing. for sure. And they're fascinated by the dunce cap that we have. Yeah. They, don't, <laughs> they don't make the connection of what the dunce cap yeah. means, but they love to put it on and kind of <laughs> run around. Um, yeah. So it's, it's great fun. That's awesome. One of the things I really loved about um, walking around and, and looking at the different exhibits is that you see names that start to sort of put pieces together for for Bloomington and Monroe County, you know, you see things and you're like, oh, well, there's a building on campus named after that person. Or um, I know we've talked about the McCullough School because mm-hmm. um, you had a class, I think, and an art, the, class, art class in McCullough School. And there's a, you know, some displays on her and what, you know, mm-hmm. why she was important and the impact she made. Uh, I came across a name um, that uh, Eagleson which is a, a popular name um, with a, a family here in Bloomington. And I actually knew an Eagleson up in Indianapolis who was from that family. They all have the middle initial V. Um, and his name was Walter V. Eagleson. And I worked with him and I was like, oh, that's his family. And it was just kind of cool to see that, that's you know, awesome. it kind of harkened back and there's those connections. Um, when The first time I was ever in the History Center for that Bloomington Restorations um, presentation, I went into the um, gift shop and they have some books in there that just show marriage records and things like that just going back I mean 1810 and whatever way way back and I opened one and I was looking for I live in a 1925 house um, down mm-hmm. near Harrodsburg and I was looking for the names of the people that built our house and I stumbled upon um, their marriage record which was really cool and discovered that um, her name her name was Laura um, she and I have the same birthday and I, yeah, I was like standing in the gift shop and I started crying. <laughs> I was just like, I knew there was a connection. It was just like really cool. But I just feel like, I don't know. I mean, this is just me. Like, I just love to have that connection with the past. Mm-hmm. It just shows that you're not just a moment in time, but you're always going to be connected to the past and to the future. And it's very comforting for me. Anyways. Okay. I'm going to end on that waxing poetic note. Karen's going to say, Send help. Uh, (laughs) And we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about um, some dementia programs that are going on and some volunteer opportunities. And also I want to talk about research. If someone is interested in doing research, whether it's on their property or on their family or on any ties to Monroe County. So stick around. You're at home in Bloomington. Hi, this is Karen Rastel with Ruoff Home Mortgage. Did you know one of the most underutilized loan programs is the Veterans Administration Loan? Whether you're active duty or retired, you may be eligible for a VA loan with no mortgage insurance and no down payment. It's an honor to assist veterans who have served our country. To see if you qualify for this incredible option, contact me today at 812-606-7653. Ruoff Home Mortgage is an Indiana corporation licensed by the Indiana Department of Financial Institutions. This is not an offer for extension of credit or a commitment to lend. All loans must satisfy company underwriting guidelines, equal housing lender, NMLS number 141868. This is your real estate real list. Practical advice on buying and selling real estate based on my experience closing over 800 home sales. Today's list is the top three things you should know if you are a buyer in a seller's market. There are actually lots of mathematical ways that we realtors determine that we are in a seller's market, but the gist of it is that there are fewer homes for sale than there are buyers. This creates a pretty stressful and frenzied market for buyers as there are multiple people competing for the same home. So what can you do to have better success in this market? Number one, have all your ducks in a row. Before you even start looking at homes online or otherwise, figure out your financing situation. Get pre-qualified. Know where your down payment is coming from. 
Get all of that ready to go because in a seller's market, sellers don't want to waste time on a buyer who can't show them that they are financially ready and able. Number two, think creatively. We all know to make out our list of wants and needs, right? But can some of your absolute needs be met creatively in other ways? For example, I had a client who needed to be in a certain school district. There just weren't very many options for them in that school district, and they were kind of in a time crunch because they were moving from out of state. After making some phone calls, they discovered that they had some other options in terms of schools that would work well for them. And this opened up lots of new neighborhoods for them to consider, and a home was quickly found. Other creative strategies? Well, there are creative options for financing, timing, minor remodeling, all things that can open up other home options for a buyer in a seller's market. So call upon your team, your realtor and your lender to help you think outside the box. And number three, work with a realtor who is full-time and obsessed. Don't try to go it alone or with someone who isn't all in. You need someone who is on top of new listings, new strategies, readily accessible and responsive. It's the only way to have a shot in this market where every second counts. For more information on being a buyer in a seller's market, listen to my Real Real Estate Today podcast shows number 89 and 90. You can find that on iTunes and YouTube. My name is Brittany and Deb Tomorrow is my realtor. She helped me buy my first home. I enjoyed working with Deb because she was patient, thorough, and made the experience fun. Deb should be your realtor too. And now back to the show. All right. Welcome back to At Home in Bloomington. I'm your host, Realtor Deb Tomorrow, and we are talking with Andrea Hadsell of the Monroe County History Center. And before we get back to her, I want to share our Facebook follow segment. Um, and this is actually a nice little tie-in. The Monroe County History Center actually has an exhibit right now about CASA, the court-appointed special advocates. Maybe we can ask Andrea a little bit about that. But CASA provides volunteer-based advocacy for kids in crisis and need. They were a guest on the show, I think it was maybe episode 14. I act like I'm pulling that out of thin air. I don't know. Um, but they were on a show and, um, and I want to encourage everyone to follow them on Facebook, um, and look for volunteer opportunities. They have short term opportunities and longer term opportunities. So don't feel like uh, you can't make a big commitment because there's still opportunities for you. Um, and also be sure to follow Jordy, the Casa dog. Um, it was just an amazing dog who supports kids who have to testify in court. I'm actually going to a meeting on Thursday and Jordy's supposed to be there. I'm super excited. Make sure you get a picture. Right? Yeah. I'm going to have to do a little Jordy selfie. So, so Andrew, can you tell us what, what's that exhibit about CASA? Mm -hmm. So that is actually our community showcase uh, exhibit case that we have on our first floor and we open it up to nonprofits in town where they can come in exhibit what content that they would like to feature. So CASA has actually featured their Playhouse project and fundraiser mm -hmm. as well as Jordy. Yep. And so, and we've had the Rotary in the past when they were celebrating their uh, 100th anniversary. We have had Habitat for Humanity, uh, and that's just in the last year that I've been here. Yeah. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for a lot of just like to give a little exposure yeah. to some local nonprofits, which Great is nonprofit awesome. Network here, yeah, exactly. I, I, I want to reiterate that the, the nonprofit network here in Bloomington is amazing. There's never this feeling that there's competition for dollars. It's how can we help each other and support each other, which mm -hmm. I just love. Um, so let's, uh, since we're talking about that, let's talk about what kind of volunteer opportunities there might be. Um, with History Center. Okay. So we do have a few volunteer opportunities, whether it is researching in our library or um, helping out with our general buildings and grounds operations. Uh, we do a lot of front desk, welcome desk attendant, uh, and uh, day of special events. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of events where we see hundreds of people in one day, like our annual Puzzle Fest, uh, which is a fundraiser. And so it's always great to have volunteers come in and just support us so that we don't kind of run around like chickens with our heads cut off right. going, Oh right. no, what do we do? Right. Um, so, so one time um, events uh, or there could be long term, like, you know, come every Tuesday from three to five or whatever. And yeah. Do, yeah. Awesome. Um, and while I say that, let's remind everyone of the museum hours. Absolutely. So we are open from uh, 10 to 4 PM Tuesdays through Saturdays. Okay. And again, our front entrance is on Washington Street. Yep. 
Um, and then, uh, you, and your website, we should remind people of that too. Karen, you usually remind me to ask people about website. I, I do. I'm, I'm behind. I'm behind. <laughs> Falling down on the job. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's the website? It is www.monroehistory.org. Awesome. And that I would recommend anyone go check out because there are online exhibits and some online information. There was one I started to get into this morning and then I was like, oh, I don't have time to like really get into it. There's a black hole that you could just yeah. start going down. Right. Yeah. Um, there's tons of archives and things, but there was um, a really interesting um, research kind of, I think it was a doctoral thesis on Monroe Lake, uh, Lake Monroe. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if you're new to the area. I was showing a property to some people yesterday and they didn't really know anything about Bloomington. So I just started spewing as I can do and telling them everything I ever want to know. But, um, Lake, they were asking about what's that Lake down there. And I was like, Lake Monroe, but it's really only been there since the sixties. And I don't know how, if people really realize how many, um, towns, homes, farms, cemeteries, are under that lake. Mm -hmm. um, and to think about, you know, we went through I-69 here recently with imminent do domain and some homes being taken. Mm -hmm. um, but to have your families, and I know that that was impactful for a lot of people, and this is very similar, you know, acres and acres and acres of farmland that has been in families for multiple generations. And um, it the stories are like, it's hard to read some of it. You know, there was mm -hmm. a lot of anger and um, and, you, and again, and you're seeing last names that you still see around town today, too. Yeah, I recently had a visitor come in who told me her grandmother's house was in the area where Lake Monroe is now. And so she was kind of recounting going to visit her grandmother and some of the fun times she had. And then all of a sudden, this project came through. And now it's in the middle of the lake. Right. So, you know, I've never heard that story. Yeah, it's it's amazing to churches and schools. They were all, you know, mm -hmm. they're all under that lake. That's why I don't swim in that lake. There's things in there. But anyways, that's a whole other story. Uh, so let's talk about um, research. Mm -hmm. um, and I want people to um, know and feel comfortable going in there and, and doing research because that's really a big, big part of, it's not just the exhibits, mm -hmm. but being available and having all of these archives for people to come in um, and research. So what are the kinds of things that people come in and want to research? Everything under the sun that relates to Monroe County. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we are the county's repository for genealogical resources. We are, first and foremost, a genealogy research library. Uh, so we have lots of things like birth, death, marriage records, indexes. Uh, we also have uh, probate and will records. We have um, a beautiful case of maps. So if you ever want to look at the county map before Lake Monroe was mm. in place, How interesting. you can do so. Um, we have some interesting court records and mm -hmm. all kinds of things that are quite interesting. If you'd like to research your house's history, or mm -hmm. if you would like to research one of the 300 cemeteries we have in the county, you can do so in our research library. I think that's something I get a lot. People want to know the history of homes. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's something I know a little bit about the history of my house. And I'd mm -hmm. certainly like to try and dig in a little bit more, um, it, in you know who are the, I know the names of the people, but you know what did they do? And that would I've be heard so stories. You know, there's a story mm -hmm. about one of the former um, um, athletic directors of IU, like back in the 30s, lived mm -hmm. in the home, is what I'm told. And then um, Doc Mitchell, who is well known Monroe oh, yeah. County, owned the property, but he never lived there. His wife lived there. Mm -hmm. He lived over in Smithville because that's where his patients were. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've heard all these stories and I'd love to, you know, be able to verify them. And so I want to encourage people that that, that resource is there. Um, mm -hmm. I had a really interesting closing last week, the young couple buying a house over in Ellettsville. And that was only the house was built in the sixties and it was the third owner, mm -hmm. um, my clients who were buying it and they brought to closing what's called an abstract, which is, it was probably three or four inches thick and it was the entire history of the property back from the beginning of time. We don't do abstracts anymore. We just do a title search um, mm -hmm. in, in real estate. But this abstract, I was like, okay, this needs to stay with the house. So you need to put it someplace safe because it would show it all. I mean, it was every record that ever had to do with that piece of land mm -hmm. back before it was a subdivision. It was amazing. 
So that's the kind of stuff you have over there. Yeah. And we're also doing a program coming up in August Mm -hmm. uh, for researching your house's history. So a lot of times we do events where we can kind of create a workshop feel where people can come in, ask questions. A lot of times have a presenter who's an expert in the community. Mm -hmm. And that way it's kind of lessens the intimidation of walking into a research library and going, I have this open-ended question right? and I don't know where to go. Right. So um, there are uh, research librarians or assistants that are on site to help? Yes. So we do have one uh, research librarian on staff, and then the rest are library volunteers who are former history professors and former um, hospital librarians and university librarians, Mm -hmm. and they are absolutely amazing. They all have their own specialities. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you're interested in doing any genealogical research, uh, if your family's from Monroe County, there are a few that we will maybe even say make an appointment to come in on this day when this Mm. volunteer is here because they will find things you never thought you could find about your family's history. So the best practice would be if someone's interested in doing some research is to call and kind of say, this is what I'm I'm interested in researching my house or my family or Mm -hmm. um, the history of such and such a building. And then you'll kind of make some recommendations on when a good time to come in would be and make sure that there are going to be people there. I mean, you could just walk in, yes. but you don't know, always know if there's someone there yes. that could help you. And if you make an appointment ahead of time, it gives our librarian and our volunteers time to actually pull the records and see what they can find yeah. to assist you. That way you're not going in and uh, searching around through a bunch of records. Right. And- if you have an right. appointment later on, you're not stressed for time. Yeah. And I bet they love doing that kind of thing too. They, they love do. the quest, right? They Just do. the, have you ever, did you see that show? Was it, um, who do you think you are? Mm-hmm. Yes. I love that show where they, it's famous people, celebrities, but they kind of trace back and it's using people and resources just like this mm-hmm. that sort of traces back. And, and so Monroe County might just be a stop for your family, you know, on the way. It, interesting because I was born in California. I'm like sixth generation Californian on one side of my family. But as my dad was doing some genealogy, um, he found that there was like a, a great, great grandfather who was in Greencastle, Indiana. Oh, wow. And it's like, well, that's kind of crazy. It was just sort of a stop along the way, mm-hmm. you know, but there are some birth records. And I remember as a kid, we're like, well, we got to go check that out, you know, because somehow we ended up back in Indiana briefly mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, um, yeah, I just think that that's so interesting to, to research. That would be really cool, one, to do the thing in August mm-hmm. on your home, especially mm-hmm. if there's going to be, like you mentioned, a workshop set up, because Deb and I have always talked about going into um, going into an event or going into a new place, which I have, like, huge anxiety to do that kind mm-hmm. of stuff mm-hmm. and not know what the flow is going to be or 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 what to expect and like you being said, unprepared. being unprepared um, because I just want to go in there and just kind of dive in and then mm-hmm. start like researching. But mm-hmm. I I think just like you mentioned earlier, the quest would be would be the fun part yeah. is mm-hmm. finding you know. But I think having things. having someone guide you in that quest makes it even more satisfying because you're going to increase your chances of success at finding. Mm-hmm what you want to find. So Karen, you made a note about 300 cemeteries. Does that boggle your mind? It does because, um, coming from a small town Mm -hmm. where there's not nearly, I don't believe there's 300 cemeteries where I'm from, but But I think you'd be surprised because I know like one cemetery, I was looking at a note. I think it was on your website on the mineral County history center website. And it only has 18 people in it. Mm Mm-hmm. So there are, but it's a cemetery. And yeah. It's certainly is something that wants to be respected. Um, I know my family has a cemetery in California that I don't think anybody else knows about except us. It's just kind of tucked away. So I think there's probably, there's more dead people out there well, than you think. <laughs> no, I find that so interesting because if you recall um, driving up, what is now 69 North headed yes. to mm-hmm. Martinsville or yes. Indianapolis. There used to be yeah. one off to the right hand side. Yeah. Um, I guess it's the east side of the, of the highway mm-hmm. that was, you can tell it was small. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't think I see that anymore. I don't know if that's still there. I don't know. But anyways, that's yeah. what I was thinking whenever she said 300 cemeteries. I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, I know Monroe County's fairly. Fairly large, but yeah. that's what I was envisioning. Envisioning is um, a bunch of smaller um, plots like that, right around the county. Yeah, but. Mm-hmm. I see dead people. I should say that. <laughs> 
All right. Um, and the last thing that I want to make sure that we talk about, because Partly because we have a theme going over the past few uh, podcasts, um, but partly also because it's just really interesting, is the dementia program that is going on at the History Center. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. So back in December, we were awarded a $30,000 community impact grant from the Community Foundation of Bloomington mm -hmm. in our county. Um, that's a mouthful. But yep. It's a wonderful, wonderful mouthful because yes. they granted us those funds to start a pilot program for our Living with History uh programming at the History Center in collaboration with IU Health's Alzheimer's Resource Services. So we are creating a multifaceted approach to create opportunities for community members and their care partners, anyone who's touched by dementia, to come in and engage and spark conversation, spark reminiscences using artifacts and archives from the History Center's collection, mm. um, but also in a way that can kind of lessen the sense of isolation in community and kind of really get the awareness out of what it's like to live with dementia, but mm -hmm. also um, connect them with everyone else around uh, them. So we're creating uh, suitcases that you can check out. They'll have about 10 to 15 objects where there will be a near field uh, communication device where you can place an object on the reader and it will say something about that object mm -hmm. or uh, say if it's a Superman comic book from the 1960s, you place it on the communication device and it will say, it's a bird, it's a plane, <laughs> uh, which is really exciting because it's quite innovative technology that not a lot of people are doing huh. um, or using yet. And are so, the suitcases mm -hmm. like year specific or era specific? So you'd be like, I need a suitcase from the you know early 50s or something? Mm -hmm. So that's, we're going to have themed cases. So okay. our very first theme case is the 1960s. Okay. Uh, originally, we were actually thinking it was going to be the 1940s and the 1950s. Yeah. But partnering with the Alzheimer's Resource Services folks. They actually let us connect with the folks that they serve. Mm -hmm. We sent out a topic testing survey and they said, actually, no, we want to talk about the 60s, gotcha. uh, which is phenomenal because it's actually putting the collaboration to the test right. and serving them the way that they want to be yeah. served. Um, so we're also going to be doing uh, the IU experience. We'll be doing parenthood rural life, and those are just the first four topics oh, wow. that we're talking about. So people would come in and ask mm -hmm. for the suitcase, the caregiver, and the um, dementia patient, mm -hmm. and um, and they would be able to facilitate communication through that. Yes. Interesting. Uh, we can also take those out to different facilities as well, mm -hmm. and that's just one part of the program. Mm -hmm. So we'll also be doing memory cafes mm -hmm. where we will create a safe space within our first floor where we will engage people with multisensory activities. Uh, we'll also be doing walks throughout our galleries when it's nice and quiet, when we're closed, mm -hmm. so that way mm -hmm. no one's kind of overwhelming yeah. them, um, but we'll also be doing tours of specific galleries with, again, a multi-sensory approach, mm -hmm. and we'll have a self-guided tour that will be available to the public, and that's just from the wow. first year of development, wow. so we're really excited. That's awesome. So we just had Jill's house on, was it the last episode, I think? Um, I was so just going to say that. Yeah. And the memory, I mean, I think she... I think she said something too, like a memory cafe. Yep. Mm -hmm. And with that, you were like the second person I've heard say that. Yeah. And so it seems like, and I don't know much about dementia or bringing awareness, but mm -hmm. it sounds like that is an underlying element or a common element to like engage the person living with the mm -hmm. dementia. Um, I think they maybe have some stronger memories of things in the past. One of the projects at Jill's house was about listening to music of a certain era. And, oh, yeah. and all of a sudden, you know, someone who couldn't really put words together is able to sing all the lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, and it just sort of creates a spark and, a, and, and some interaction. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like kind of the same vibe. Oh, yeah. And that's, again, where our partnership with uh, IU Health has been phenomenal because we're actually learning why that is. Right. We're learning about the different areas of the brain and training our staff and our volunteers mm. to actually understand how dementia as a disease affects a person. So that way we can truly address, um, you know, if we need to bring in music, what mm -hmm. kinds of music, why does that, why is that the case? Um, or what kinds of prompt questions we can use to engage people in conversation so that it's not just us lecturing for a lesson. 
I wonder how many other history centers are doing similar things. It seems so cross, um, cross pollination is what I want to call it. You know, that's actually the question we've been getting a lot and we've, it's kind of been one of those, well, why aren't you guys doing this? Yeah. It's oftentimes a lot of art museums mm, that are okay. working with folks who are living with dementia. Uh, but really, the program that we were inspired by was at the National Museums of Liverpool. Oh. Uh, and so they actually have a program and an, a mobile app called mm-hmm. the House of Memories, which is on a larger scale for them. Um, it's gone nationwide in the UK, mm-hmm. and it's quite helpful in really just curating your own memories using objects from their museum's mm-hmm. collection. And so the Minnesota Historical Society actually just became their official partner outside of, and they're now the U.S. headquarters okay. for the House of Memories program. So other than that, when it comes to a smaller scale, we are actually as pioneers from Liverpool. Yeah. The pioneers right. or we're the, the Mavericks. Yeah. As some of right. our friends from Liverpool have called us. That's awesome. So. Well, that's super exciting. And I didn't realize, um, but you had told me that the mayor made a declaration just last week, um, mm-hmm. about Bloomington being a dementia friendly city. Yes. Um, and so that's just really, I think a theme that we're going to see continue. There's, there's a reason that that theme is continuing on the podcast, uh, because we mirror, we try to mirror what's going on in mm-hmm. Bloomington. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we had a ton of fun. Thank um, you for if if me. you could only listen to uh, our break time conversations, <laughs> we had a ton of fun. Uh, and I want to encourage everyone to check out Monroe County History Center. They're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4, or their website, which is MonroeHistory.org. Mm-hmm. Um, and check out their events too. And we're definitely going to help promote that um, learning about the history of your home uh, event uh, coming up later this year because that's way cool. So, all right. Thanks for listening. And we will be back with another episode. You are at home in Bloomington. Got a show idea? I'd love to hear it. And be sure to contact me for all your real estate needs and questions too. You can email me at deb at realrealestatetoday.com and follow me on Facebook at Deb Tomorrow Realtor. To contact Karen Rastel for all your mortgage needs, call 812-606-7653 or log on to ruoff.com and go to the Bloomington Center. Thanks to all the Bloomington people who make production of At Home in Bloomington possible. Special thanks to superstar producer Rachel D. Gregorio, digital guru Cynthia Hogan at Monster Digital Marketing for website design and hosting, and video genius Wes Lasher in the production house for engineering the show.